Hey, hey, hey there, friends. Thanks for joining us for the finale of our series, Things Jesus Never Said. And today, I hope not to disappoint as we look at a really tough topic of something, something we wish that Jesus maybe would have said, but he didn't. So without further ado, let's jump in. Well, we're gonna take it up a notch today as we end the series, Things Jesus Never Said. Because today, we're actually talking about a thing that Jesus never told us to never say. Or never told us to say, or told us to never say. Yeah, you get the idea. But to really help us get the idea, I wanna ask you a question. What would you do for a Klondike bar? Okay, I actually don't think Klondike bars are actually that great, but their marketing starting back in like the 80s was pretty great. I mean, come on, think about it. Dun, 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 dun. Like you, if you know the jingle, you know it. Um, it was all about, in case you don't know, let me just kind of fill you in. What would you do for a Klondike bar was like this extremely, um, this, this slogan, this whole branding thing of getting people to do these extreme things of commercials of people doing these crazy wild things simply for a slab of vanilla ice cream coated in a layer of chocolate that by my standard is way too thin a layer of chocolate to make this like a real dessert. It's, it's like almost health food at that point. It's just, but anyway, the truth be told, I have done in my life some wild stuff for some really insignificant rewards. Then again, that's what adolescence is for, right? Like that's what we call adolescence, right? Um, but today we're talking about something that we do or at least that we need to do to get something that is pretty incredible. And actually, it is the most incredible thing, and not just a nice thing to have, but it's actually the single most necessary thing for your life. How about that? Like, pretty high stakes then of what we're talking about getting today. And it's important that these are high stakes, that it really does matter a lot, because the thing that we need to do to maintain access to this thing that we're talking about here. Well, for some of us, it's maybe too steep of a price still, no matter what, to be willing to pay. Like even despite being offered the only thing we need, for some of us, we might go, I, I still can't, it's too much. Now, I hope not. I hope that you're willing to go there and, and to do it, what we're gonna talk about today, and to be strong enough to be willing to trust Jesus on this one as we go into it. But if you do, I gotta warn you, you might need to make some tough decisions today. If we're gonna lean into this message today, you might need to actually have some real life applications. God might, during this time together today, he might remind you of some things that have happened. Uh, he might bring up some stuff in your life or choose to deal with some issues from your past. And so that's my fair warning to you as we get into today's message and all that. In fact, I actually still remember, uh, just so you know, that I've, I've, I've lived this. About a decade ago, I remember hearing this message or a variation of this message from the Bible preached. And, uh, and I remember needing to walk out of the service before it was over in that church that day and, and make a phone call. But I'll tell, me, I'll tell you more about that story later. I just want you to be prepared that we mean business today as we end this series. Now, so Jesus is gonna do some teaching as we're gonna jump in here in a second. He's doing some teaching one day and he decides to teach the crowd how to pray. Not like a script of like, here are the exact words or even really a formula. I really think it was just an example filled with nuggets of helpful insight on what makes prayer meaningful and, and helpful and useful and all that kind of stuff. Now I know we're talking about things that Jesus never said in this series, but let me just start us off by uh, having us look at a little of what he did say in Matthew 6, uh, verses 9 through 11. Jesus says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now so far, it checks out, right? Acknowledging God's throne in heaven and the holiness of his name. 
and then asking for God's kingdom to come and, and his will to be done as much here around us as it already is in heaven with him. And then asking God to provide the daily bread, like our daily necessities of life. Uh, so, so far, so good in the prayer. And then Jesus is going to start talking about forgiveness. And what Jesus doesn't say, as he's about to pray in this prayer and tell us how we should pray about forgiveness, Jesus doesn't say, and forgive us our debts, but destroy everyone who owes us. <clears throat> he doesn't tell us to pray that way. Or he doesn't tell us to pray, um, forgive us our debts even though we're still gonna hold some grudges against other people. And also, lastly, he doesn't say, forgive us our debts, and may everyone who's hurt us never get forgiveness from us or from you. See, it's pretty classic, and maybe you've heard it before, but what Jesus does say is he says, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And it, he seems to be assuming that we will, that we are, uh, we are forgiving them. And then he even goes on, just in case there was any question of the assuming that he's doing, and he says this, and I'm gonna tra change translations to New Living Translation for these verses. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Honestly, forgiveness can often feel and often seem cruel or, or unrealistic to some of us when it comes to some of what we've dealt with. Now, I don't want to in any way, just so you know today, appear to make light of the things that you've gone through, maybe that you're currently going through or, or in the future that you will go through and pretend like they don't matter. We talked just last week about bad days that we go through. And some of you, you've gone through some really, really bad days. And some of those bad days came as a direct result of some very bad things that some other people did. A best friend lied to you or lied about you. Maybe someone that you loved or admired let you down and wasn't who they seemed to be. Someone didn't pay you for the work that you did and they didn't pay you what they owed you. Someone broke a promise to you. Someone pretended to care about you, but then all they ended up doing was just using you for their benefit. There was someone, for some of you, who should have loved you and should have protected you, but instead they hurt you. So tragically, there are some of you who will have experienced very real abuse of any different kind. And here you are, maybe even decades later, years later, and you still feel that pain and you can still carry those scars. So if you hear me encouraging you to forgive and you think, that's not fair. Like, you don't understand what's been done to me, what, what I've had to go through. I want, to, I want to just first start off by acknowledging that pain and by acknowledging that, and I want you to hear me, that it was terrible, and it was wrong, it was disgusting, and it was awful, and it breaks the heart of God to see that kind of sin and evil exist in his world. And I want you to know I'm, I'm truly sorry for whatever it's worth to hear me say that to you, not knowing exactly what you've gone through, but I just want you to know I'm sorry that you, you experienced it. And actually, there might even be another level of pain that some of us have experienced. Because there's a certain kind of pain when someone hurts me personally, but then there's this pain of when someone hurts someone that I love. And some of you know about that. Some of us find it easier maybe to forgive someone who's wronged us, but not so much someone that we love. I mean, how do you forgive something that seems unforgivable? How do you forgive something so brutally wrong? And, and how do you live out what Jesus taught us to do here when it comes to forgiveness? How do you do this stuff? Like how on earth could we possibly do this? Well, Colossians 3 verses 12 and 13 say, put on then as God's chosen ones, his people, 
holy and beloved as you are, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Now here's the, here's the clue, here's the key. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Must forgive. That's, that's tough. He doesn't give you a way out. He doesn't give you an option. He doesn't say, well, I mean, may, but he says, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. We're called to forgive others as we've been forgiven. So I think the first step here today it begins with really reflecting on how we've been forgiven. First, forgiven of what? Well, for, for me, forgiven of some pretty bad stuff. Maybe not as bad as, as stuff that we've experienced, but listen, we're sinners too, aren't we? Like you've messed up too. You've broken people's trust and hurt people. And like I'm not trying to say whether you, what you did was worth but just recognizing when we look at how we've been forgiven, that we've been forgiven of some bad stuff too. And also forgiven in what way as we're looking at how we've been forgiven? In what way? Well, we were forgiven at the cost of Jesus' very blood. Like it cost him his life to forgive us. You know, I, as I was getting ready for this message and, and borrowing a little bit from uh, Life Church in their series when they did a series called Things Jesus Never Said, I found this quote by Andy Stanley where he says so accurately, in the shadow of my hurt, forgiveness feels like a decision to reward my enemy. But in the shadow of the cross, forgiveness is merely a gift from one undeserving soul to another. So I wanna ask you, which shadow are you in right now? Because if you're still in the shadow of your hurt, it is gonna always seem like you're just letting them go. But as we get more and more into the shadow of the cross, where we see Jesus on that cross for our sins, we can start to look at forgiveness differently. But I wanna go, I wanna go even more practical. I really like being practical and not just kinda of like ethereal out here when we talk about matters of, of following Jesus here. And I'm not sure you're gonna like this, just so you know, but here it is anyway. Another practical way that we can work forgiveness into our life for others, pray for them. Like, pray for God to do a work, a, a good work, like, in their lives. If, a, if applicable, if it makes sense, Pray for their salvation if they're not saved. Pray that they would come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. That pray for them to be in right relationship with Jesus. Pray that they would experience the blessings of God in their life. And I know, I know, this may not be our instinct or it may not even be something we feel like we are even willing to consider. But in the same sermon where Jesus was teaching the crowd how to pray earlier when we were just reading it, he had something else to say about this too a little bit earlier. He says, but I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And I love this explanation here, this metaphor. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So Jesus is basically, he's unraveling the classic argument that we want to make when it comes to forgiveness, which is simply, it's just not fair. Forgive them. I can't forgive them. It's not fair that you would ask me to do this. It's not fair what they did. It's just not fair. And Jesus is like, I get that. But my goal is to have you look more and more like your heavenly father. And he's pretty unfair in how he allows so many undeserving people to experience some of his goodness. I mean, it's not the world we live in where if you do something bad, you always have bad days. Good people have bad days, bad people have good days. God is, is kind of kind in that way to allow people to go through <clears throat> to go through parts where their life can be experiencing blessings. Again, I look at my life and I go, man, I don't deserve a lot of the good that God's allowed me to have. And I've seen other people who are, are, are just outright evil even prospering. So we're beginning to see here that forgiveness is actually less about that other person. It's more about the goodness and grace of God. It's more about the character of us. It's really less about freeing them because they may not even realize that they hurt us or be eaten up about it at all. I mean, maybe we wish they were, but that doesn't make it so. Maybe they don't remember. See, I referenced it earlier, but about a decade ago, 
I was sitting in a church service in my, my hometown of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, what I, I was between youth ministry positions. So I was staying with my parents in their home. In the meantime, as I was between different positions. And I was at their church one Sunday when the pastor preached the passage where Jesus says that if we have unforgiveness towards someone, that the Father would rather we hold off giving him gifts of worship till we've cleared things up with them. And it was just like in that moment that day, like God had my number. Have you ever had a service, uh, a message that you've been sitting in and you've been in that church and you're listening to it and you're going, man, God is speaking directly to me. Like this message was right to me. Uh, that's, what it was, that's what it was like for me that day. And I just want you to know that I'm praying today that for your own heart's sake, that God would reveal some names, faces, memories that he's needing to, for you to experience something like this as well. But anyway, immediately in that service, I thought of, as we were talking about forgiveness and bitterness and all that, I thought of my former boss and pastor um, who I just stopped you know, working for and all that. And I, I had some real unforgiveness and bitterness towards him. Honestly, maybe unfairly, I felt like he was unfair. I think in some ways I'm now realizing it wasn't as unfair, but in that moment, I just was really eaten up about it. And it tainted not only how I thought about or talked about him, but it tainted a lot of other stuff in my life. It really did. And if you don't know how unforgiveness will do that, will taint all these different things, maybe is doing that in your life, is tainting all these other things, uh, my, bet, my bet is that there's people in your life that know that it is. If you're not aware of it, there's probably some people that are aware of like, wow, you are really still bitter about that. Your unforgiveness is showing and you may not even know it. And some of you, I'm, I'm being so straightforward because I really want you to realize that you and your perspective, where you think this is okay, this is healthy, it's not. Trust Jesus on what healthy is. Anyhow, I heard the message loud and clear. And so listening to the pastor's clear call to action, what he told us to do, as the worship team began playing after the message, before the service was over, the message had concluded, I walked out of the service, I got to the parking lot, I pulled out my phone, and I called a pastor on a Sunday morning, which was kind of convenient when you think about it because I knew that I wasn't probably gonna get him, that he was just gonna go to voicemail. So I got his voicemail and I left him, you gotta imagine, a pretty awkward voicemail explaining how, how I'd felt hurt, how I'd felt um, unforgiveness towards him and was looking to get rid of that and was looking to um, not hold that against him anymore and not like he owed me an apology, but forgiving him in the same way. And so later he would call me and he let me know that he accepted my apology for holding on to uh, unforgiveness. Very graciously, he, he did it. And he also explained that he had no idea that this rift even existed. See? Like, that unforgiveness that I had would have never eaten him up or messed his other relationships up, but it, was, it would have done it for me. It was already kind of doing it for me. It was ruining me. And just so you know, that phone call didn't completely nail the coffin shut and all of a sudden we were good. I still had to keep praying for him to get my heart to be in the right place. Because you know what? Our prayers for those that hurt us may not do much to change them, but it will often do a lot to change us. It changes our hearts to better appreciate the forgiveness that we've been given as we pray for them. We realize, man, I've been forgiven a lot. It changes our hearts to grow in compassion for others that maybe we wouldn't have compassion for. And then it changes our hearts to heal them as well. So let me ask you, what would happen if we didn't act as though Jesus said, I'll forgive you, but you don't have to worry about forgiving anyone else? What if we acted as though he said that we were meant to forgive just like we've been forgiven? What marriages could be saved or at least way healthier? <laughs> what families could be healed? What work relationships would be made healthy? What bitterness would be gone? What freedom would we find in that kind of life? There are some very big things that Jesus might be asking for, um, for you to forgive right now. But is it possible that the greater the wound that we have, that we are experiencing, that we are, we are truly going to forgive someone of, the greater act of worship that is to a loving God and a greater act of worship that we can give to him. 
the greater appreciation that we can show him by going, I really get how great you were in forgiving me. That's why I'm willing to do this. Like the, the greater the hurt that we're forgiving and truly forgiving, the greater the witness that is to lost people that we can demonstrate there really is a forgiveness in Jesus that makes no sense. The greater the freedom we can experience, the greater the hurt, the greater the freedom we'll experience when we forgive. See, let's, let's understand that we have been forgiven, that the cross was for us, but it was also for them. As you and I recognize that Jesus said some pretty hard things in his ministry and his life here, one of the hardest ones is to forgive others as we've been forgiven. But the beauty of forgiveness is that we don't have to muster up in ourselves all of the things that God calls us to do. In fact, we never have to do that. What we do in obeying and following the commands of God is we simply tap into His power, His strength, His spirit, and then in that, we walk in obedience to what He's called us to do. So, first off, I wanna make sure that you know that God has offered forgiveness to you, and if you've never accepted that, today's the day, and we wanna be a part of your story. You've not sinned too much. We talked about this in the first week, but I just wanna remind you, you've not sinned too much or done something so egregious that God's grace goes, Ah, can't cover that. But you can't just expect that you can push back the forgiveness of God and somehow experience it. You need to accept the gift that God is offering you of His grace and let it transform you. And if God's grace is transforming you, for those of us who have accepted that forgiveness, then by really being rooted and abiding in Christ, we also ought to be some of the most forgiving people. We are not vindictive, we are not bitter, we are gracious and loving because we realize that is what Jesus called us to do and we want to be forgiven. So we ought to forgive others. May we go into this week wrestling with the, the implications of what it would be like for us to accept the forgiveness of God and for some reason be unwilling to show it to others. May we instead recognize that we have been given, forgiven much so we'll forgive a lot too and live in that freedom and victory.